Welcome to the Arctic Research Consortium of the U.S., ARCUS, where Arctic research is connected since 1988. My name is Bob Rich, and I'm the Executive Director. Thank you so much for coming to our 23rd Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation in Washington, D.C., where we're delighted to welcome Elizabeth Arnold. ARCUS connects Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration, providing the essential intangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a not-for-profit consortium working together to promote exploration and understanding of the Arctic. Whether you're here or online, we invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. All types of organizations are eligible to become members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic research can become an ARCUS member. I invite each of you to join us. You can find out more and join online at www.arcus.org. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to a wide range of leading Arctic researchers and leaders for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. If you're in the room, you should have received a seminar evaluation, which I'd like you to return to the registration desk after the seminar. And online, you'll have an opportunity to fill out an evaluation survey at the conclusion of the seminar today. We're currently planning for upcoming speakers and need your suggestions to select the best possible speakers. For those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Arcus Webinar, to discuss the event. Um, and uh, we're currently joined by more than 200 registered participants in at least 18 U.S. states and in Bulgaria, Canada, Finland, Germany, Iceland, the Netherlands, Norway, and the United Kingdom. Whoops. For those of you who are on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions you have about Arcus or Arctic research and to forward to us here in D.C. any questions for Ms. Arnold. You can type into the chat pane of your attendee control panel at any time, and we'll try to answer the questions during the Q&A session at the end. I want to acknowledge the partners in our seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space in the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Polar Research Board for help with registration, and of course, the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS in the seminar series. Now, introduction for our speaker. Full bio is online. Elizabeth Arnold is a former National Public Radio political correspondent and associate professor currently of journalism at ARCUS member University of Alaska Anchorage. She's the producer of ArcticProfiles.com, which features audio and video from a wide range of voices in the Arctic. While at NPR, she reported stories on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Alaska political issues, and climate impacts in the Arctic, among many others. Now, as her Twitter profile puts it, she's former NPR correspondent, loving life in Alaska, mom to amazing son Jack, teaching journalism at UAA, telling stories from the Arctic. Please join me in welcoming once again to the U Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series, Elizabeth Arnold, to tell us about the face of climate change in the Arctic, national media's role in public disengagement. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me, especially um, whoever's in Bulgaria, um, where someone just pointed out it's, it's probably the weekend by now. Um, thank you, Bob, and um, the Arctic Research Consortium for having me and being open-minded enough to allow a non-scientist uh, to give a talk. Uh, given that I'm a journalist and not a scientist, I ask you all in advance to cut me a little slack. You're the experts. Um, and as Bob mentioned, my background is in radio at NPR, not TV, so I would kindly ask you all here in the room to close your eyes for the rest of the speech. And those of you in cyberspace, just turn the, the video part off and, and listen while you clean your garage or, or uh, check your email. Seriously, it's, it's very good to be back in DC and even better to be back here without having to cover politics. That said, um, I was fortunate enough to be chosen as a fellow at Harvard's Shorenstein Center, where I've had the opportunity these last couple of months to reflect on my profession, in particular how we in the media are doing when it comes to covering the important topic of climate change, especially from the part of the world that I'm most familiar with, which is the Arctic. Um, I've lived in Alaska now for uh, more than half my life. I've been fortunate enough to have been to the North Pole twice, uh, 10 years apart, and to have been on U.S. and Russian icebreakers in the Bering, Chukchi, and East Siberian Seas. So I have a 
pretty good idea um, as a layman about just how much this part of the world is changing. As a journalist, I'm compelled to uh, start this talk with the news, which of course, as most of all of you are well aware, sea ice extent in the Bering Sea is at an historic low. This has been well documented in the news, and I saw an interesting, um, well-meaning tweet the other night about it. Something like, uh, scientists have never observed so little ice in the Bering Sea in spring, so sound the alarm, bang your pots and pans. And that made me think about my own research, which is that we have been banging pots and pans, and we have been sounding the alarm, and it's apparently not enough. Um, it's falling on deaf ears. And let me be very clear at the start. It is critical to talk about the impact of climate change in the Arctic and worldwide, but it's insufficient. There's a growing body of academic research about this, and that's what I was interested in looking at further these last few months uh, at the Kennedy School, specifically looking at news about the Arctic, and even more specifically, stories that have a human face. Um, let me backtrack a little bit um, to explain the genesis of this. 10 years ago, in July of 2008, as an NPR uh, reporter, I reported on environmental conditions in New Talk. Um, as some of you know, a remote community of about 400 Yupik people in northwest Alaska. Nutak was and is still losing 40 to 100 feet of land a year to erosion and sinking because of permafrost that's no longer permanent. Flooding is threatening the homes, the school, the only supply of clean water. I chose to report on Nutak because um, they were actually working on a relocation plan and they had voted to move to higher, more stable ground. This is 10 years ago. My story compared the actions of Nutak with Kivalina, an Inupiaq community of about the same size, um, situated on a barrier island further north. Kivalina faced similar conditions, and they had just filed suit that same year against ExxonMobil for damages caused by climate change. That suit was dismissed. In the 10 years since my report aired on NPR, news outlets from all over the world have visited Nutak, Kivalina, Shishmaref, Shaktulik, and a dozen other Alaska Native communities uh, thinking about relocation because of the effects of climate change. The national stories largely fit the very same narrative pattern, with images like this one of houses tipping precariously off cliffs and phrases such as impending doom and cultural extinction. The reporting paints a picture of tragedy and hopelessness framing community members as victims to sell the urgency of mitigation to the public. As one CNN reporter unabashedly said on camera, a trip here is like a trip into a disturbing future. This image of a house in Shish Shishmaref, um, shot by an AP photographer, has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the Financial Tribune, Der Spiegel, Esquire, The Guardian, Mother Jones, ABC, CBS, CNN, PBS, NPR, Bill Moyers, Huffington Post, and Vox, among others. The repetition of this narrow narrative in national and international media for the last 10 years hasn't resulted in a groundswell of support for mitigation or adaptation, or much in the way of funding for relocation. Nor has it resulted in any major public policy at the state or federal level. It may have even undermined the ability of these coastal communities to help themselves. Another caveat here, and an important one, I'm talking about national reporting. Local and hyper-local journalism has done a much better job of reporting the whole story of these communities and their efforts to respond. And a shout out, if I may, to uh, the Climate Justice Resilience Fund for supporting this kind of local reporting, um, for example, in the Bay of Bengal. We all know the Arctic is warming two to three times faster than anywhere else on the planet, and for Americans, the Arctic is Alaska, where snow and sea ice have been declining, so rapidly that villages like Shishmaref have no buffer from fall and winter storms. That's compounded by melting permafrost and accelerated erosion and foundation problems for structures and entire communities. We all know this story. While it's important for the public to understand and see this threat, it's also important for the public to see and understand how people are responding. Anthony Leiserwitz is the director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, which does great work 
They conduct research on psychological, cultural, and pub political factors that influence environmental attitudes and behavior. Um, he's best known for his re research indicating six Americas, these categories of public opinion about climate change on a scale from dismissive to alarmed. And he and others say that because the media has focused disproportionately on impact, America's, Americans are tuning out. In the case of New Talk, the journalists come in. They already have the story written. They want to do a story about climate victims, climate refugees, and tell that story, period. But what's an increasingly more important and more complex story is how New Talk, Kivalina, and other communities are responding. So the premise of my research is that this repetition of a narrow narrative that focuses exclusively, exclusively on impact leaves the public with an overall sense of powerlessness. I took a look at five years of national media coverage of climate change in the US Arctic, specifically stories about these kinds of communities facing coastal erosion and relocation, to argue for journalism that provides a more representative view, reporting that includes responses and innovations and increases pressure on policymakers to act rather than offering excuses for inaction. The importance of narrative in telling the climate change story can't be underestimated. Many Americans have not experienced the effects of climate change personally. Most, however, have already formed some kind of opinion about it. Climate change didn't come into worldwide consciousness through local experience, but through public discourse, largely us, the media. Um, there's an early mention of climate change by Robert C. Cowan in the Christian Science Monitor. He, uh, he said, industrial activity is flooding the air with carbon dioxide gas. This gas acts like the glass in a greenhouse. It's changing the Earth's heat balance. It could bring anything from an ice age to a tropical epoch. Every time you start a car, light a fire, or turn on a furnace, you're joining the greatest weather experiment men have ever launched. You're adding your bit to the tons of carbon dioxide sent constantly into the air as coal, oil, and wood are burned at unprecedented rates. He wrote that in 1957. Reporting the science, journalists were already establishing the concept of human-caused climate change in the public mind. Now, over the past several decades, as media coverage of climate change has grown, so has academic research of the coverage. This is what I've learned. In fact, there may be more people studying that than there are people like me covering climate change. Um, a key study was that of the Boykoff brothers, Jules Boykoff, who's a political scientist, and Max Boykoff, a climate and media researcher. In an analysis of four major American newspapers between 88 and 2002, they concluded that we journalists, by relying on our traditional norm of balance, had introduced a false equivalence into coverage, what's known as false balance or balance is bias. It's the practice of adding a contrarian view from an organization skeptical of climate change, um, for example, the Heartland Institute, to balance the view of a scientific organization. Um, I remember myself being asked uh, by an editor to include another viewpoint in my early point uh, reporting about findings of the IPCC. Another look seven years later, though, found that the same organizations that had somewhat self-corrected from this practice. Boykoff then called attention to a new trend of daily fear, misery, and doom headlines and articles. And he said, while dramatic and fearful representations can successfully raise awareness and concern about climate change, these kinds of images were also likely to distance or disengage individuals from climate change, tending to render them feeling helpless and overwhelmed when they try to comprehend their own relationship with the issue. Boykoff is currently director of the Center for Science and Technology at the University of Colorado Boulder, which created um, a, a media and climate change observatory. It keeps daily track of climate change stories in 38 countries. It's, it's really a, a really interesting resource. This is a screenshot of their website. Um, I'd encourage you to check it out. He says there's still a pervasive doom and gloom in stories about climate change because there are no entry points. There's no way to engage, no sense that people can do anything to affect change. OK, so while it might seem contradictory to provide information about mitigation or adaptation in a story about climate change impacts, it's standard procedure in the coverage of public health. 
What reporter covering a flu epidemic wouldn't think to provide information in the same story, or at least in a sidebar, about the availability of a vaccine or how the disease was being transmitted? It's not advocacy. The public health reporter isn't telling you to get the vaccine or to avoid transmission, but providing more information, telling the whole story. Lauren Feldman uh, of George Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication, who's now at Rutgers, says, unlike public health, stories about public change, about climate change, seldom discuss what's called threat and efficacy information or impact and action. In a study that she did of coverage by US network TV news between 2005 and 2011, she found that impact and efficacy were rarely discussed together in the same broadcast. And to the extent that efficacy was discussed at all, it was framed in terms of conflict, fight between political parties, or the impossibility or downside of any potential remedy. Her most consistent finding is that including the efficacy or solution information increases people's sense of hope, and that all the emotions, fear, anger, hope, hope's the one that is the most consistent driver of intentions to engage. So we journalists most likely fail to tell the solutions part of the story on any consistent basis because it's not as dramatic and it's max of advocacy. But if you pair the science with what an individual can do about it, it looks like you're making an argument for a specific action. So it's left out. But Feldman's research indicates that if it's left out, people tune out. These findings aren't brand new. Uh, Yale's Lizerowitz dubbed this uh, the hope gap several years ago. And in his Six America study, as I said, he divided Americans into these six groups, the dismissive, the doubtful, the disengaged, the cautious, the concerned, and the alarmed. Interestingly, even the alarmed, the most concerned about climate change, were not likely to know how to respond. So we journalists shape narratives on climate change, and we do so by choosing the importance of a storyline, one storyline over another. I teach journalism, and I teach this every semester. A classic storyline arc is in the shape of a U. A man falls into a hole. And he figures out a way to get himself up and out of the hole. The storyline ends slightly higher than where it began and is encouraging, because after all, the man climbed up and out. The story is not encouraging if he simply falls into the hole. Yet most climate change reporting is the story of falling into an inescapable hole. Over the last few decades, national and international media outlets have spent considerable time and money sending correspondents to remote communities in the Arctic and Alaska to witness and report on the human impacts of climate change. Anthropologists Elizabeth Marino and Peter Schweitzer noted in 2016, quote, Rural Alaska has been besieged with unprecedented numbers of journalists, photographers, scientists, and politicians, all eager to engage in a discussion, or even better, to get a photo of people who have firsthand experience with climate change. Marino and Schweitzer, who themselves were documenting the impacts of climate change in Shishmaref, reported that while we were making dinner with a Shishmaref resident who had already been featured in a Canadian documentary about climate change and had been quoted and photographed for People in Time magazines, two television crews, one from Japan and one from Colorado, simultaneously were filming a story about climate change in his kitchen. You get the picture. The shape of the narrative begins in the early parts of your reporting, in the very questions that you choose to pose. For example, how's it feel to be a climate victim? What's it like to know that you may lose your home in the middle of the night? Are you afraid of losing your culture? Just how bad are the storms? How does it feel to know there's nothing you can do to stop it? These are pointed questions. Quotes are cherry-picked. Sally Russell Cox is the community planner for the state of Alaska who's been working with the village of Newtok since 2006. She's relentless. She's optimistic. She's a hero. <laughs> She says she rolls her eyes when she gets yet another email from a media organization asking for contact information. How do I get out to New Talk? Who can I talk to? She wants to say, have you even looked and seen how many times this story has been told? And she says, it's always told the same way. It's always the same story. And it's not the whole story. These people aren't victims. 
To determine the dominant narrative of national media coverage of climate change in the Arctic, we conducted an analysis of stories containing the key terms climate change and Arctic in print, radio, television news outlets over a five-year period, March 2013 to March 2018. The analysis included the years before, during, and after President Obama's high-profile visit to Alaska in 2015, just as the U.S. assumed chairmanship of the Arctic Council. I won't bore you with the numbers. But the analysis establishes that most news stories over this time period, not surprisingly, focused on the science of climate change with no human subject. When these news stories did include people's voices, they were overwhelmingly experts, scientists, policymakers. Few included the voice of actual residents. Of the minority subset of stories that had a human subject at the center of the narrative, it was that of an indigenous person. And of that subset, the individual was overwhelmingly framed as a victim facing environmental threat or loss. These stories frame communities as endangered and entirely incapable of responding. None of them use words such as strong, capable, and powered to describe these people. In fact, the word strong appeared only to describe the forces of climate change, as in strong storms, or opposition to solutions, such as strong resistance from Congress. Visually, a majority of television and print stories use wide aerial shots, like this one of Kivalina, along with eroding beaches and cracks in the tundra to convey vulnerability, raising the question of why people would ever choose to live in such a place, a question that these stories seldom answer. It's important to note, as most of you know, New Talk and other communities in Alaska that are most at risk were actually required to settle there. Yupik and Inupiaq people lived semi-nomadic lifestyles in the region for thousands of years. In the 50s, government mandated all Native children receive formal education, even if it meant sending them away to boarding schools hundreds of miles away. In the region, schools were built where barges could offload construction materials on sand spits, barrier islands, in river deltas prone to flooding and erosion. Because of that mandate, the communities grew around the schools. I remember 10 years ago, Lucy Adams and Kivalina telling me about her family's decision to paddle 70 miles by skin boat from Point Hope to Kivalina, quote, because we were not in school, us children, and so the nearest one was going to be here, and that's why we're here. The narrow narrative in media coverage of indigenous communities facing climate change isn't limited to Alaska. A researcher at McGill, Ella Belfer, and her colleagues looked at reporting in eight major newspapers from 1995 to 2015 in Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand, and they found that indigenous people are most often framed as victims and harbingers of climate change to promote the importance of broader mitigation to the general public, rather than initiatives that would directly support these communities. A more qualitative look at national media coverage reveals the same pattern. Networks like ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, along with Multimedia sites, Vice News, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, they begin with these somber music beds and images of waves and sandbags and houses perched along these eroding bluffs and aerial shots like this one. And major newspaper and magazine stories follow a similar, similar structure, all chosen to set a scene of environmental disaster. The words the communities used, the communities described as being erased, swallowed up, swept away, washed away, in the process of disintegrating, vanishing, disappearing, one bad storm away from being wiped off the map to the point where it will be lost to the sea and even cease to exist. Community members are described as first climate refugees, climate change victims, and uh, the New York Times recent uh, uh, title is Carbon's Casualties. Most are asked to describe or physically demonstrate on camera just how close their homes are to the threatening ocean or river that is, quote, literally eating the village alive. The substance of most of these stories is emotional, and it's an emotional description of the problem. How the community is responding is an afterthought at best. If the story does include a response, they're framed as obstacles, the inability of residents to get federal or state funding for relocation, the inadequacy of retaining walls that have been funded thus far, what might be lost if the community moves, and the difficulty of responding. Most repeat the impossibly high relocation price tag calculated by government agencies. You've all heard this, $400 million to relocate 400 people. Again, begging the unanswered question. 
in a few more comprehensive reports about New Talk, the community that is the closest toward relocation. Its new housing site, Nektarvik, is mentioned only in the context of how little progress has been made, the few buildings that have been erected, and the difficulty of getting construction materials. Notably, finally, most reports end with a further message of impending doom, leading the audience deep in the hole with little hope of climbing out. He knows the time is coming when all this could be lost, a ruined world, and the Inuit are facing it right now. A Vice News report titled, Climate Change is Killing This Alaska Village, ends with relocation coordinator Romy Cadiente, well known for his relentless optimism, practically in tears, after being asked on camera, it's going to take millions of dollars to move New Talk. Why should that money be spent moving a couple hundred people? There's little, if anything, in most national news reports about resilience. The Yupik and Inupiaq have lived in the region for thousands of years, weathering and adapting to wrenching environmental and cultural change. It doesn't fit the narrative. But leaving it out, as researcher Henry Huntington, who's addressed this forum, uh, says, ignores history. He points out, if people in the Arctic weren't good at making the best of what they encounter, there wouldn't be people in the Arctic. There are four million people in the Arctic. Henry Huntington, he has studied uh, human environment interactions in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland for decades. And he says media coverage of the human impact of climate change not only provides a distorted view of the communities. He says, I don't see how it can't distort your perception of yourself and your community too. It, perhaps, it, it, it perpetuates this idea of being a victim. If the only thing we want to know from you is whose house is next to a road into the sea. We in the media aren't the only culprits. Huntington and some of his colleagues are looking at a similar narrow focus in scientific research, that life in the Arctic is being studied solely through the lens of climate change and that research should be broadened to deeper socio-ecological contexts and community needs. Let's take a look at innovations and the conditions that are fostering them. As Henry says, these people aren't just sitting around waiting for the next IPCC report to come out to tell them what's going to happen and how to adapt. Over the last decade, we journalists have justifiably called attention to human impacts of climate change with these stories about communities facing coastal erosion. But there's still no federal or state government agency with a mandate for funding to re relocate communities. There's still no government framework to address slow-moving disasters. While this is undeniably an important story worthy of attention, it's also important how the story is told. And the predominant narrative is environmental tragedy involving people with little hope or little ability to respond. Frame analysis is often used to look at the content and impact of stories. But the absence of certain aspects and information can be just as critical as what's included. New Talk's decision to move as early as 1994 and the community's efforts and progress toward relocation nine and a half miles away from its current site is what's been framed out, at least in the national stories. Relocation has required raising millions of dollars, navigating a bureaucratic morass. It began with a land swap in 2003 after years of negotiations with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. It involved the formation of the New Talk New Talk Planning Group in 2006, a huge volunteer group of community members, public servants, nonprofits. They've been working with a huge range of organizations from the Fairbanks Lions Club to, to Harvard Law School. To date, with the help of financial and technical assistance grants, volunteer training, and collaboration with all kinds of agencies, the new community of McTarvick is taking shape and can be seen on a clear day from New Talk. McTarvick, which I'm sure many of you know, which means place to get water, has a freshwater spring and is on firm ground, the volcanic rock of Nelson Island, long a hunting and fishing area for the people of New Talk. The process of moving a community, even a community as small as New Talk, is painfully incremental. But it's a process that's worth documenting for the same reason so many media outlets sent correspondence to New Talk in the first place. While the media presents New Talk's predicament as harbinger of climate change impacts, New Talk's response might serve as a model, not only for communities in the region, but for coastal and island communities facing the same challenges in the rest of the country and world. 
For five years, they teamed up with the Department of Defense to build the village foundations. At McParvick, there's seven homes now constructed at the new settlement, with four more due to be completed this summer. One is a prototype designed by the Cold Climate Housing Center that's extremely energy efficient and movable. Another 13 homes are expected to be delivered by barge in the summer of this summer, this coming summer. These are retrofitted barracks from a military base in Anchorage. That brings the number of homes up to, I think, 24, um, which hopefully paves the way for state agencies to fund more infrastructure, a power plant, an airport, and a school. The story of communities facing coastal erosion and relocation in the U.S. and worldwide fits into a much larger pattern of news coverage of climate change. The threats to humans, polar bears, outdoor ice rinks in Canada, entire ecosystems is told on a daily basis. Um, per Espen Stokness, I hope I said that right, um, he's a psychologist at the Center for Climate Strategy of the Norwegian Business Institute. He's a Green Party politician. He's coined the term apocalypse fatigue to describe how people tire of constant threats that challenge their daily life. And as a defense mechanism, they don't take them seriously or even avoid them. If that's true, then the repetition of the narrow narrative of Utah writ large may not even be that compelling. If my role as a journalist is to seek the truth and report it so that citizens will be informed and effective, reporting just the doom and gloom about climate change might be insufficient. Uh, So-called solutions journalism is often dismissed outright by traditional journalists. I've dismissed it myself um, as feel-good news uh, or advocacy. David Bornstein, who is the co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network, which trains journalists to report what's missing in today's news, says it's not enough to know what's broken, that people need to know how problems could be or are being fixed. This doesn't mean filling the hope gap with hopeful stories, Rather, he says it means allocating appropriate attention to stories of constructive problem solving, stories that are important but often neglected. If people are aware of a problem and they don't have a sense of what can be done, it leads them to opt out. By showing them that something's working in one place, it takes away excuses for failure elsewhere, and it also puts pressure on public officials. In the context of climate change reporting, Bornstein says he feels like journalists keep adding the word really to the same story. So like, this is really bad. And then next week, this is really, really bad. No, 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 this is really, really, really bad, which eventually doesn't resonate because people don't want to hear the dire warning again and again. It's just understanding that people need on-ramps, especially for difficult, threatening issues. So showing them that here are companies making changes to keep profits but reduce the overall emissions footprint, or here's a new kind of financing for renewables, or here is a place where people under threat have managed to stay on the land and maintain their culture. You're just telling the story of what human beings are doing right now around climate at this point in history. Constructive problem solving, practical, replical, examples of what people, businesses, nonprofits, and governments are doing. News coverage that includes responses as opposed to just documenting or dramatizing the impact provides what Bornstein says is a more complete view of society. It gives people the ability to imagine their own responses to see themselves as part of a solution or even agents of change. So how, if at all, does this relate to scientists or science communicators? I know you're out there. Um, I think in much the same way. While it's difficult and in some cases inappropriate and almost impossible to talk about mitigation or adaptation if you're someone studying sea ice loss or walrus mortality or spectacle diders, but I suggest that when you're pressed for superlatives, which is what we in the media business do, think about how you're telling the story. Why are you doing the research that you're doing? If we're all going to hell, why would you be doing it? What would be the point? Why bother? There's got to be a reason that you continue to study and report what you're finding. Try and tap into that if you can. It was heartening to see that the IPCC took a hard look at communication recently and came out in January with a handbook about effective ways to engage the public. If you haven't seen it, I'd suggest it. Um, some of it's very practical, lead with what you know, talk about the real world. But there was a, a line tucked in there about how including responses and solutions is also important when it's possible. Understandably, scientists wince when they're asked why pelagic 
benthic coupling or the availability of geolocated return energy waveforms over Alaska and Western Canada should matter to somebody in Peoria. I get it. I feel your pain. I understand your frustration. As a journalist, I get the same question from my editors. Make the guy in Peoria care. It doesn't have to be a literal direct connection. What you're studying doesn't have to save Peoria from climate change or make someone in Peoria buy a Prius. But people do relate to real stories, emotion, failure, aspiration. I'd rather hear that you spent two weeks on the ice and lost all your equipment but are still committed to trying again because it's just that important to you than all the superlatives about the warmest year ever. It's relatable and it just might inspire me. In closing, here's a content contemplative shot. This is a shot from the North Pole that I took 10 years ago. Um, researching this paper has been my own response to a troubling sense that I have felt over the years while reporting on the lives of people in Alaska and the Arctic at large. No matter how much I tell myself the, the newsroom cliches that I'm shining a much needed light, I'm bearing witness, seeking the truth, it has felt at times exploitative. As climate change continues to transform the place where I live and work and pushes remote communities in the Arctic to the front and center on a national and international stage, I felt compelled to reconsider my role as a journalist. Along with seeking out those who've been studying the media's coverage of climate change, I had surprisingly similar conversations with two men who've long been in the trenches. One's a scientist and the other's an advocate. And both of them walk the walk more than most. And I posed the same open-ended question to each of them. How do you think we in the media have been doing on this? Bill Muma, the scientist, said, not so great. Uh, he's trained as a physical chemist. Muma spent most of his life translating science and technology into policy terms, most recently at Tufts Fletcher School. He was the lead author of three IPCC reports, including the 2007 report that was recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize. In Williamstown, Mass., he built a highly efficient net zero home himself that uses no fossil fuels. Now he's in his 80s and he has barely paused in his work. I found him editing his latest paper and preparing for a lecture that night on the importance of trees as carbon sinks. And he said, I've always been solutions oriented. I'd rather work on mitigation than on how bad it's going to be. His assessment of the media's coverage of climate change is that it's incomplete. He said, the subject's difficult to convey, it's complicated, it has multiple dimensions, and some of it's depressing. But he said, I'd like to point out there's an optimistic side to this, because there are ways for us to address this problem. I think it's important for people to understand the urgency, but it's the urgency to act. And we have tools that we can use to act. That's what I think is missing in the message. On the other side of the country, on the top floor of a six-story building in downtown Seattle, Dennis Hayes nodded his head in agreement with Muma. Hayes created the first Earth Day in 1970, expanding it to more than 180 nations. He, uh, in the Carter administration, he headed the Solar Energy Research Institute, which is now the National Energy Research Lab. He's a tireless advocate of sustainability. He's currently the president of the Bullet Foundation, uh, dedicated to protecting the ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest. He designed and built Bullet's current headquarters. It's a commercial building in downtown Seattle that is the greenest and most sustainable in the world. Gesturing around him, he said, it's a place that, honest to God, shows America, shows the world what you can do today. Like Mumahe says, there's a repetitive message of general pessimism in climate change reporting. Having spent much of his life as an environmental advocate, giving what he said were really, really depressing speeches that truthfully weren't that effective, he now says, there's a responsibility for those of us who are active in the field, and I think a responsibility on those of you who are covering it to make sure that hope is part of your stories. It's not just houses falling into the sea. I talk about this building, my building, what's possible. If we journalists have self-corrected for false balance in climate change reporting, the challenge may now be to self-correct from this steady drip of catastrophic visions. New talk is moving to Murktarvik. It may be slow. There have been setbacks. There have been divisions. But this community, threatened by climate change, 
has long been eager to move and is adapting one grant, one innovative idea, and one barge load at a time. The people of Newtok are undaunted by the challenge and their community will not cease to exist. In fact, life just might be a little bit better on higher ground with fresh water. It's a story I think is worth telling. It's a story that provides a more complete view of society and it's maybe even a story that's inspiring. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay, so uh, I can take questions from online or in the room. If you're in the room, please be sure to press the big button at the bottom of your microphone to turn it on before you ask your question. Anybody here have any questions um, or type your questions online? Yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks for... Yes, uh, my name is Heather McRae. I direct the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, and thank you very much for the shout out. Um, I was in Alaska not too long ago and spoke with some people from New Talk. Um, and, and I'm really excited to hear your message about changing narratives and the need for solutions. And we are trying to figure out in our grant making how to better support the development of these solutions, um, particularly on the adaptation and resilience side, where I think narratives are hard um, you know your your mention of mr. Muma and Hayes and their their energy efficient buildings um, some of these mitigation solutions now I think the media is getting good at telling and a lot of people are getting good at telling or at least better <laughs> but on the on the adaptation side our our grantees who are doing this work are struggling to tell the solutions. And some of the things they, they need to tell around navigating that bureaucracy, around constructing new um, agreements to avoid conflict on the, the ocean as the, the straits open up, um, or um, uh, some of the very subtle things we see in the Bay of Bengal around um, gender norms and and girls' vulnerability in a changing climate and and the solutions to that. Uh, these are tricky. And as we move towards more solution stories, I wonder if you have thoughts on how to tell these better. What you know, moving from the what what narratives to the really how to get there. Because I I see a lot of people really struggling, even people who see the challenge and want to address it. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, it's a huge question, and I'll take one part of it. Um, I, and I think it's probably the most troubling for the people who are on the ground. And again, um, I do think your efforts and um, other organizations' efforts to support the local reporting and even hyper-local reporting and training journalists, training local journalists, indigenous journalists to tell their stories is a huge part of this. Um, because you know we the national reporters they 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 fly in and they um, it's always they're the first ones that have ever been there um, you know a reporter I, I really admire I, I was just looking at a, a, a TV story that he did years ago and he was standing at the edge of um, he was standing in New Talk actually and he, he was saying I'm standing at the edge of the edge of the world and I thought I could go to like Boston Harbor and say that <laughs> I could go to Florida. I could go to Miami and say that. So the importance of local journalists, absolutely, um, and you're already there. But I think um, the other big issue for people who are in the midst of facing the challenges is that they don't want to tell the story until they've succeeded. And we all have this feeling, and, and journalists too, um, pitching stories to, to editors and to organizations. Uh, you know, it's got to be they did this, you know, okay, it's done. People are living at McCarvick, the community is there. But honestly, especially in this issue of adaptation, you know, it's all being written right now. It's, it's all happening right now. And people are going to learn a lot more from failure than they are from success. It, you know, it's something that scientists, um, when you do science communication, um, they don't quite get that. But actually, when the science scientist tells you all these things that went wrong and then eventually they figured something out. It's, so, it's such a better story 
it, it, when I teach journalism, I always play bad stories because students learn a lot more listening to bad stories than they do from the perfect story. Um, but when you're in the moment, when you're in the trenches and a community is divided, isn't sure what they want to do, or there are factions pitted against one another, um, you know, it's like, well, we don't want to er air the dirty laundry. Um, but there's a way to do it that still communicates how hard this process is that is so important to get out there because so many communities, again, worldwide, are, are facing these challenges. And so that the, the failures are just as important, if not more important. Um, that would be one aspect I would emphasize. Um, not to be afraid to tell an incomplete story because it because it's not complete. I mean, McTarvick is, is I mean, nobody's living there yet, but it's still incredible model in terms of everything that's happened with the planning group and you know, um, that story needs to be. I think I've I think I've made a very I think I've made that point <laughs> for the last half hour. Thanks. Uh, we uh, have a bunch of questions online. I have one here from Robert Grumbine. It says that uh, in line with uh, sort of avoiding the same stories told the same way over and over, uh, there seems to be the same handful of scientists interviewed for any story that talks to scientists. What can we as scientists and the scientific community do to help spread that out? Yeah, that's a really great question because um, what we journalists do, and this doesn't, I don't mean to be piling on my co colleagues here. I, but what we do is, you know, someone does a story on something and you want sources, so you look at that story and you say, oh, those are those guys, I can call those guys right there. Um, there are now organizations, and we were just talking about this, Bob, there are now organizations, um, Harvard has one at the Shorenstein Center called Journalist Resource. Um, there are other ones, uh, MIT has one, I believe, and so does Columbia School of Journalism, where, you, where journalists can go and get entire lists of, and, and punch in gun violence. Arctic climate change, um, you know, benthic communities, and and have lists of names. And I believe you can add to this that that Arcus is has a list like that. And so I would encourage scientists to get on that list because we don't like we journalists don't like using each other's sources. We want to find new sources. Great. Um, what can be done to, uh, this is from Bud Ward, uh, what can be done to better inform top line editors to recognize the value of this kind of solution journalism you're advocating and how can reporters overcome editors' resistance? Wow. Thank you for that question, Bud. Um, Bud is uh, with the Yale program that I was telling you about. Wow, editors. Um, I think the I think it's starting to happen, and I think what's happening in journalism is the traditional legacy um, organizations, NPR, The Times, Journal, LA Times, um, we're getting beat um, by Inside Climate News, Climate Connections, uh, other um, different forms, and I think wh when the, when when you get those stories to those organizations, either those reporters get scooped up by the legacy news, and that's great because they're great reporters and they're really covering this stuff well, um, or the big boys take notice and they start, they start imitating. I think there hasn't been enough um, quality solutions oriented reporting on climate change. The whole, and, and I know Bud knows this, the whole for climate changing in general, the news hole, is really small. We don't think it is because we all live it, and so we're on all these listservs and everything, and we see all this news. But in general, the public is not getting much climate news at all. And so what we need to do is change the, the uh, percentage of these kinds of stories in that already pretty tiny hole. I think it's starting to happen. Um, I noticed that the uh, Washington Post is... Um, or maybe just did uh, hired a whole new uh, head for their climate uh, change reporting group, and it's hiring a, a lot more reporters. And I think, I think it's growing. Um, but I, I, I believe that the the good quality solutions oriented stories are at the uh, at the level of Inside Climate News, and and uh, so hopefully the big boys start copying them. Um, I also think training. I think um, the Society for Environmental Journalists could. Uh, very easily and should do a big program on this kind of reporting um, at their next conference. 
Great. Yeah, over in the room. Hi, Maggie Chan with the Sea Grant Canals program from the Alaska Sea Grant. Um, my question really is, so coming from a science background, we don't often have the tools to learn how to communicate science. And quite honestly, being contacted by a journalist can be a scary, <laughs> a scary endeavor. And the burden of creating your elevator pitch and everything for your research is on us. And we often don't have a lot of time or the tools to do that. And so my question really is, when we get contacted by journalists about our research, what power or what tools do we have to sort of shape um, the narrative so that it is more solutions oriented and it's not quite so doom and gloom because I think we do see that in the science community. I think it's the communication aspect. Yeah, that's a, again a great question and I, I totally feel your pain on this. And I, you know, before I answer that, I do want to say there is a huge emphasis on science, making scientists these great communicators and you have to be able to like do your own story and, you know, carry it. And I, I kind of resist that because that's my job. I mean, I think you need to be good communicators, but I don't think you need to be journalists. You don't need to know how to tell the, you know, put all the pieces together. And I mean, you, you're too busy for that, right? I mean, you, you've got stuff to do. Um, but I think when you do get that call, in, 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 instead of either hanging up or um, answering the questions and then hanging up and saying, oh my God, what did I just say? Um, resist, the, resist the urge. Um, that you will feel um, to to do the doom and gloom or the hype. Um, we all are we are all trained to sort of hype because we want to be on the front page or we want to be you know the first story and all things considered. So we you know we we want the biggest, the furthest, the warmest, the the biggest chunk of ice. The you know this is the end kind of a story. And and if I'm asking you those questions, which I, I wish I I hope I wouldn't, but if, if someone is, resist resist the urge to answer those questions. You know, it's okay to say, and I've had scientists say this, um, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, and it, it kind of embarrasses the journalist because it means that you're on to me. I'm not going to go there. I, I know what you're doing here and I'm not going there. Um, what I want to tell you about what I'm studying is this. Um, but but as I said in, in my talk, think about why it is you are doing what you're doing instead of just telling me what you found. Uh, and what I mean is it's not literal. Um, there, was a, there was a piece in the New York Times um, two Sundays ago by two scientists about shorebirds. It was an op-ed actually, um, a pretty long op-ed. It was about, you know, shorebirds declining for many reasons, including what happens in the Arctic and what's happening in the Arctic, along with, you know, being shot and wetlands disappearing. But it was extraordinary in that two-thirds of the way through the piece, it pivoted into, there is some hope. And it wasn't hope about emissions reduction, but it was, it just offered what, um, what some people are doing to protect shorebirds. But it was just astounding in that it was in this story because you just don't see it that often. I'm, I'm not saying that scientists should do this in an interview, but if you tell me why you're excited about what you do, or your failures, or um, you know what just what your day is like, that is so much more relatable to that guy in Peoria and inspirational to that guy in Peoria than. This mean this could mean the decline of this species, <laughs> you know, which is like, wow, seriously. <laughs> and if that's so, why are you even studying? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, there's just there's ways to be uh, there's ways to connect, and 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 I I think thinking about that in the the front of your mind as opposed to your elevator speech, um, and resisting that that pressure to you know give the superlatives is the way to go. So I have so many great questions here, but I think we only have time for one more. So um, this is from Kristen Tim. Um, says that a Media Matters report recently showed that climate change reporting increased last year, um, but uh, attributing that to uh, Trump's comments about climate change and withdrawal from Paris. So uh, what advice do you have for journalists and scientists and communicators um, when that's the loudest voice in the room and uh, uh, journalists can't resist recording what Trump's talking about? <laughs> 
Yeah, so th so those numbers did go up, but that's because th they aren't the kinds of stories that you and I are talking about. They're the Trump stories. Um, you have to persevere. I mean, you know, I, I covered the American West for a long time, and I had just been a political reporter for 10, 15 years, and I could, you know, I could barely move the dial with um, sage grouse, um, endangered species, because of everything that was happening in D.C. But you have to, I mean, we still have to do these stories. It's it's not a reason not to do these stories, and my hope is as as uh, as the the Trump noise fades, these stories rise to the level of public discourse that we need. Um, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm always telling my students that journalism is more alive than it's ever been because there's so many ways to self-publish and um, there so many ways to get your foot in the door. And my hope, and, and I, I see it, is that there are a growing number of environmental journalists who are committed to doing this kind of reporting. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, let me just uh, wrap up with a few concluding remarks. Thanks again, Elizabeth, for an amazing presentation. Um, I want to share the uh, level of enthusiasm that the people online have uh, for uh, the value of what you're talking about. So thank you very much. Uh, very uh, meaningful and interesting and, and provocative to us, I think, to be able to tell a story that's uh, going to make more of an impact. So thank you. Um, wanted to uh, mention a couple of upcoming events. Uh, we have a uh, seminar coming up in a couple of weeks on May 23rd as part of our uh, new program, Empowering Arctic Indigenous Scholars and Making Connections. Two uh, very interesting uh, uh, researchers, scholars uh, from Arctic Indigenous communities, uh, uh, Teresa John and Rosemary Oktuvek, uh, are coming to Washington, D.C., and they will be giving a presentation on their work um, on May 23rd. So you can check that out on our uh, website. And also in uh, June, uh, we're going to be at the uh, Polar 2018 conference celebrating uh, the Arctic research community and uh, 30 years of consortium. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, you can uh, see the recordings of all of our seminars online, uh, which will be posted uh, uh, within a week of the seminar uh, for this one. And I encourage you again to become a member of our community, um, to stay engaged. And thank you so much for participating today. Please fill out the evaluation, which will appear on your screen shortly. Thanks, and have a great day.